Good afternoon. Uh, today I want to talk to you a little bit about work that we've been doing, asking a fundamental question, which is part of moral judgment. How do you know whether somebody's a good or bad person? How do you know whether to trust somebody? It turns out that this is a pretty difficult problem, but I'm going to take a step back to describe a little bit why it's such a problem and a mystery for psychologists and talk a little bit about this pinnacle of human civilization, the mailbox. What's so special about a mailbox? Well, in every neighborhood that I've ever been in, we have these things right outside of our homes. Mine's actually across the street from my house. And there's no lock on it. Sometimes I don't check it for two, three days. I leave for weeks. I get valuable stuff in there. It's always there. If you really wanted to, you could make a killing just driving up and down streets and taking crap from people's mailboxes. Well, not crap, but valuables from people's mailboxes. <laughs> but nobody does it. Why? Right? Why aren't people doing this more often? Well, it turns out that at least one answer is that our species is what some people have called hyper-cooperative. We're really extreme with our cooperation, with our altruism, with our helping of others. So compared to every other species on the planet, we'll go out of our way spontaneously to help strangers. And you can even see this in the behavior of toddlers. Right? They'll spontaneously help a stranger that they see in need. The problem is, with a species that's hyper-cooperative like we are, is that if we indiscriminately trust everybody, that is, if I have zero qualms about trusting that you won't take my stuff, uh, I won't take yours, my backpack and my whole life is right there, I trust that it's going to be there when I come off the stage. Um, if there is a population like that, it's very easy for a cheater, to use the lingo, to kind of take over. That is, if there's one individual who recognizes that we're all suckers, they can actually start taking everybody's stuff. And from an evolutionary perspective, that person would gain more resources, they'd be more likely to reproduce, and cheaters would overtake the population. Therefore, cooperative species would never make it. This is, in fact, commonly known that some people are like this. This is one of my favorite examples. Um, here I was gonna, just going to say that our hyper-cooperation makes us able to do things that we would never be able to do alone. Right? So there is a big benefit to our hyper-cooperative nature. We can do things that no species on the planet has done, like build the International Space Station. But again, somebody can take advantage of this, and people in fact do. This is one of my favorite examples, the hacker Kevin Mitnick, who was a very well-known hacker in the 80s and early 90s, who would break into computer systems just for kicks. He wasn't a bad, bad guy. He wasn't stealing anything. He just liked to break into computer systems. He got caught. Um, but what he was really good at wasn't just code. It's not just that he was really good at computers. He was really good at hacking human beings. And so if you read Kevin Mitnick's own account of what he did, most of the exploits that he took advantage of were human beings. So I'll give you an example. If he wanted to gain access into an office building that had really heavy security, you needed a card to get into the building, um, all he would do is print out a fake card and wait for people to come back from lunch. And he would sort of join that group, walk behind them, because who would close the door on the person right behind them coming back from lunch? That would be extremely rude. Well, Mitnick knew that this would be extremely rude, that human beings don't like to be rude, and so he would gain access with a literal piece of cardboard that he printed his picture on. Those exploits were the ones that actually enabled him to be a successful hacker more than just his code. So we have to look out for people like this. If we are to maintain this hyper-cooperative nature, the, ones that lets, the, the one that lets us build space stations, we have to keep an eye out. And this is one of the fundamental insights of evolutionary biology and moral psychology and everything in between. 
that in order for a species like us to reap the rewards of cooperation, we have to look out for cheaters. So how do we do this? How is it that we can tell when most people are to be trusted, how can we tell that some people are not to be trusted? Well, we don't have great answers for this, but we've been trying to do it for a long time. In fact, there is an ancient pseudoscience, we would now call, of physiognomy. Um, here, the assumption was that you could tell someone's character traits from just looking at them, right? from their facial features. This is what we do in our fiction. Right? We like to make our villains very apparent. Right? So Darth Vader looks like a villain the moment you see him. This is the stereotypical or prototypical mustache twirling villain. But in real life, people don't actually look like that. Um, but people thought they could develop a science of this. So this is from a book published in 1902, a comprehensive guide to being able to determine the character traits of individuals based on the features of their face and the shape of their head. So here on the left, you have a very honest person. Here on the right, you have a very dishonest person. You, if you're looking at the person in front of you, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> we know that this isn't true, though, right? This is BS. This is pseudoscience. It wasn't really based on, on observation, even though for hundreds of years it persisted. But there was one insight there, and that is that we are motivated to try to figure out whether someone's good or bad from the moment we meet them. And in fact, research by Alex Todorov at Princeton has demonstrated that within a split second of meeting somebody, you've already made a judgment about their goodness or badness and about their competence as well. And in fact, we do use facial features to make these judgments. So this is uh, from his work computer-generated faces that vary on various dimensions. On the left, you have a face that's very untrustworthy. On the right, you have a face that's very trustworthy. People do use these cues in order to make these judgments. They do it quickly and unconsciously. It's just that there's not much evidence that we're right, if by right we mean we're discovering underlying character traits. We are right in that if you show people images of politicians who have run for office somewhere in the country that you've never heard of, we're actually pretty good at guessing above chance whether they won or lost the election. Not because, again, we're accurate about these things, but because everybody's biased, including the voters. So people who look more competent actually get more votes. How's that for depressing? Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll never get elected. Um, My colleagues and I have tried to do a little bit more digging to see if we could find what it is that can make us accurate. And one of the things that we at least tried to argue was that it wouldn't be a static feature of your face, right? It wouldn't be just the shape of your head or the width of your eyes, but it would, it would be something dynamic. That is, when you meet somebody for the first time, something happens that makes you determine whether or not they're trustworthy. Um, the first set of studies that uh, we did had to do with nonverbal cues when two strangers meet each other. And in this case, the two strangers were told that they were going to talk for five minutes, and after that, they were going to play an economic game that involved the decision to trust another person or not. Right? So we had two conditions here. In one, we had people meet face to face. Another one, we just had them do an internet chat. We were interested in whether the nonverbal cues would be meaningful. Um, and then we had them play this economic game that I'll quickly describe. It's basically assessing trust or cooperation. You get four tokens. The other person gets four tokens. If you swap tokens, that is, if I give you all four of my tokens, they double. Let's say each token is worth $1. If I give you my four tokens, they turn into $8. And if you give me yours, it turns into $8 for me. So it's good to cooperate. We both start with $4. If we swap, we both end up with $8. But a sneaky person could convince you that they'll swap. But in actuality, 
they'll keep their $4, get eight on top of that, and they'll get 12. So we had participants play this game, and this is what happened. There was no difference in the amount of tokens they gave each other based on whether they saw each other face to face or not. In fact, this is something we always find. People just do cooperate, and they give about two of their tokens, right? But what we did find was when we asked people to predict what the other person would give, they were more accurate predictors when they were face to face. So what you see here is the internet chat on the left. The bigger bar indicates a prediction error. So fewer errors if they saw each other face to face. Well, luckily, we videotaped those face to face interactions with three cameras, and we had undergrads do a bunch of coding. And we figured out that, in fact, there were a few gestures that seemed to be predictive of somebody not cooperating. These were touching your hands, touching your face, crossing your arms, and leaning back. Those were predictive of uh, not cooperating. Um, so we wanted to actually manipulate this. So in collaboration with Cynthia Brazil, who's a roboticist at MIT, um, we had people interact with a robot who we could control. And we gave people actually, I don't have a video for you, but this is Nexi, a social robot that can display emotion on, on her face. I say her because the voice that we used was female in this case. And we had participants interact with the robot and play this very same game. And in fact, when we programmed Nexi to make those gestures, the crossing of the arms and the touching of the face, um, they trusted Nexi less. And in fact, when we had them say, why don't you go ahead and play this game and give Nexi tokens, they also gave her fewer tokens. They didn't like her less. Everybody likes robots. <laughs> but there was something they were picking up on. Those cues were actually um, making them trust her less. So there's some evidence that we're accurate in reading nonverbal cues in an interaction with another human being. Five minutes of discussion, we're picking something up. Now, participants don't know that they're picking this up. Like, they couldn't verbally report to us that those were the cues they were picking up. But we saw that those were the ones that were most predictive of accuracy. There's another way in which we can assess somebody's character, and that comes from seeing what kinds of judgments they make in everyday life. Right? So, how do you resolve a moral conflict? And in moral psychology and in moral philosophy, we have a ton of fake moral conflicts, so we just pick them. Oops. Um, you may have heard of the trolley problem. There is a version of this. Essentially, I'm not going to read the text for you. Uh, the choice is whether or not to kill one person in order to save five. In this version of the scenario, there's a train coming down the tracks, uh, and there you are on a little bridge overlooking it, and there's a large person right in front of you, five people stuck on the tracks. You could push them, right? They're teetering over. All you'd have to do is just little fall to their death, stop the train, save the five people. We ask individuals to answer 14 of these. Now, in the philosophical literature, if you say yes, sacrifice one person to save five, we would call you a consequentialist. If you say no, we might call you a deontologist. Those are just the terms that we use. But essentially, is are you making the calculation? Do you think that the right moral thing to do is to make the calculation or not? Giving people 14 of these, we could give them a score. In this case, the higher the score, the more likely they were to say, sacrifice an innocent person to save five people, or whatever the version said. We also asked people a bunch of individual difference measures. I'm going to tell you about the two most important ones. This was a measure of psychopathy that included items like people cry way too much at funerals. <laughs> In case you didn't know, answering yes means you're a psychopath. Um, <laughs> some of you might be puzzled. Uh, we also gave them a scale of Machiavellianism. Never tell anyone the real reason you did something unless it's useful to do that. Scale of manipulativeness. And here's what we found. Their score on utilitarianism or consequentialism, the more likely they were to say, I would sacrifice an innocent person to save five people, the more likely they were to score high on these scales. So your judgments, that of being willing to say that you would sacrifice an innocent person to save others, seem to be predictive of some very untoward character traits, right? So there, there is some, something that is being tracked by 
your willingness to say that you would sacrifice an innocent person. In a follow-up set of studies, um, we actually had people play a very similar game to the one I just described to you with, that we did with Nexi the robot. But first we told people that the person they're playing with said, yes, push the fat man to his death to save five, or the person said, no, I would never sacrifice an innocent person. As it turns out, people are more likely to trust the person who says, no, never sacrifice that innocent person. They also uh, view them as more moral than the person who's willing to sacrifice. And when we do the economic game, they're more willing to give more money. That is, as a measure of trustworthiness. They're more willing to swap the money, expecting to receive it back. So there, again, is a cue that those kinds of decisions, that of being willing to harm an innocent person in order to save others, might be indicative of low trustworthiness. Um, it's not that simple, though, um, because it's not just the kinds of judgments that you make, but how you make them. So let me give you an example. If you were to be faced with a dilemma like this, where you can throw somebody to their death in order to save five people, and you did it immediately with a smile, like, yeah! <laughs> that would make you less trustworthy, right? Hopefully. Um, but if you did it with weeping and gnashing of teeth, with much conflict, that actually might be a good decision. So another set of studies, we asked people a very similar style of questioning. We said, there's a hospital administrator who has a big chunk of money that he can use to save little Johnny who's dying from an organ failure. Uh, it's an expensive procedure. Or he can use that money to buy more equipment and save many more lives in the future. Right? So it's a little bit hard to make that decision to buy more equipment and let the five-year-old boy die. Um, but you might think it's justified. Well, what we manipulated was whether or not the hospital administrator made that decision quickly or slowly. And here's what we found. So on the left, people who said that they would save the child, it didn't matter if they said save the child with the money quickly or slowly. Um, but if they said sacrifice the child in order to, or allow the child to die in order to buy the equipment, it mattered. If the administrator was like, yeah, yeah, go ahead, let the kid die, they didn't like him nearly as much. This higher numbers indicate positive moral evaluation. Um, they didn't like him nearly as much as if he had done it slowly. So it's not just that, it's, it's not so much that we don't like people who are utilitarians. It's that we're reading into the judgments that they're making, and we're inferring something about their psychology. What are we inferring? I think there's a whole set of traits that we're inferring whenever we interact with somebody. What kind of person is this? Do they have empathy, kindness, warmth? When you tell me that you make a quick decision that's calculating to sacrifice an innocent person, it doesn't sound like you have those traits. But if you tell me that it was a really difficult decision to make and that it hurt you, but you did it because that was the right thing to do, then it's OK. The last example that I'll give not, comes not from our research, but from some of my friends who actually wanted to know whether what these decisions were picking up on was just that emotional aversion to harm. And sure enough, it seems to be the case. People who are likely to say that they wouldn't sacrifice an innocent person are the very people who are unwilling to do things like this, very twisted task. Take a really realistic looking baby and smash it on the table. Take a prop gun that looks very realistic, point it at the researcher's head and pull the trigger. Uh, take a hammer, researcher's wearing a fake plastic leg, you know it, they know it, smash the hammer into their leg. Physiologically, they measured their reaction at these tasks, the participants, and individuals who had higher physiological reactivity that were more averse to harm were actually more likely to say they wouldn't throw the fat man off of the footbridge in order to save uh, more people. So it seems as if what we're doing in our interactions is we're trying, we're motivated to infer what kind of a person you are. And a lot of that is what kind of a set of emotions, traits do you have? And how can I tell from what you're telling me? So every interaction leaks with information about our moral character, at least people think that it does. 
So when we have to answer the question, who is it that you should trust? Well, I don't know, but you should at least trust your instincts a little bit. If somebody's pretty creepy and they very quickly say that they would push someone to their death, you probably shouldn't trust them. Thank you. <laughs>